Fantastic. So welcome to the fourth book in the Dominican uh, Studies um, group um, in the book club that we've been holding from the Dominican writers for, for almost a year. And um, we want to make sure that we continue um, highlighting books about folks in the Dominican Republic, as well as um, stories that dictate um, things that happen in the Dominican Republic and also Dominican writers. Um, that's something that I love the, the organization, Dominican Writers Association, that what they do in terms of highlighting um, authors that usually don't probably won't get the type of um, promotion. And we, as we all know, we know that many Dominican writers have so much, so much, um, so much um, to give and, and provide. So this is the fourth book, Alu, um, My Baseball Journey. Um, and this is an exciting book that I, I wanted to also have it as my first book before, but I wanted to provide the historical context. But the reason I chose this book is because it shows you the historical context of of, of a Dominican coming, one of the first Dominicans to be highlighted on in the major stage, especially in the 50s, uh, where many people did not know what was a Dominican, as well as, you know, Dominicans, we, we do favor African Americans in the South at that time, and for many African Americans looking at this Black man that does not speak uh, English. So it was a, it was a learning experience that we, and he, Felipe Alo, he was able to highlight his struggles in navigating his way to the top because it was not easy. Okay, so my name is Professor Remisel Salas Rojas, um, and I'll get into the, the the book. Does anybody have any questions? I want to make this interactive as possible. Okay, remember, don't be shy now. Okay. So I like to start and kick it off and, you know, brush um, the cobwebs and people's tiredness of their long day to a Dominican word of the day. And the Dominican word of the day today is called nitido. If anyone can tell me what that means, as well as where do you think the word comes from? Okay, everybody knows the slangs, but where do you think that word comes from? All right, so if anybody, you could just raise your hand on the, not, not on, the, on the thing, on the, <laughs> so, uh, okay. Oh, so Mari, Mariela, you go ahead. Okay. So hey everyone, I'm Mariela. Um, I'm gonna assume that it has something to do with like a Spanglish vibe, and I'm gonna say that it means neat, like nitido, like cool. Is my stab at it. <laughs> no, that that's that is the answer. Jesus. I guess I, I last the last three words, the last three things were harder, but I thought I, I was going to get you guys, but she is 100% correct. So the Dominican word of the day is, you know, nitido, cool. Something. What's my prize? You get, a, uh, you get a high five from me here. A virtual high five. Damn. <laughs> that works. All right. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, so that's the Dominican word of the day. I, I love the, the, you know, the Spanish language, but, um, the type of Spanish that Dominicans speak because it usually has a historical context of why we say certain words. Even though, you know, some people want to lose all the, the slang, they will be, they're appreciated a lot uh, when you travel um, to the DR in different Latin American countries. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Nitido. So overview of the book. All right, before we get to the chapters, uh, uh, the overview is that <clears throat> Felipe Alou, he grew up in, in Jaina, in the Dominican Republic. There's El Doce de Jaina, and it's Jaina Jaina, right? And El Doce de Jaina is, from the, is in the capital, heading into Jaina. And um, Felipe Alou dreamed of being, being a doctor, but he never, never dreamed uh, of being the first um, baseball player and manager um, that was taken from the Dominican Republic, coming straight from the Dominican Republic. Of course, there was a Virgil, which was the first Dominic, the first player to play in the major league of Dominican descent, but he lived in New York, in the Bronx, went to Clinton High School. Um, many people don't know that. 
And, um, but this is the first player that they got. And for, for many reasons that Felipe Alou in the book was very enjoyable is that nobody knew the success that you can, uh, being a baseball player could have been, all right? As everybody knows, Dominicans, Dominican parents, there's probably like three professions that are realistic to them. Anything else is not realistic. So being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer is what people, that's all they want you to be. So all he wanted to be become was a doctor and, um, and help his family as well as his community. Um, we're gonna discuss why that passion is there. It says it, it says it in the first chapter in terms of, you know, seeing the disparities, the poverty in, in Haina at that, at that time. And he wanted to make sure he made a difference as well as have a, a profession that's gonna feed his family and things of that nature, all right? Felipe Alon uh, played 17 years in the major leagues, accumulating more than 2000 hits and, and 200 home runs and then managed um, for another 14 years, okay? And four was with the San Francisco Giants and 10 with the Montreal Expos. I don't know how good you remember those years. I remember being one of the biggest Expos fans. Who, who was an Expos fan here? No, just me. Wow. Uh, that team no longer exists, uh, but the Montreal Expos, it was an exciting, exciting thing where once he was on and, and gold Mets, because the son was the manager before he got fired. That's, that's a story, but, but Expos, uh, he literally was, the reason why I respect this man so much is because he got on, he opened the doors for everybody and basically started taking players that nobody else wanted to the Expos, like Pedro Martinez, they said he was too short, he was not gonna be good enough, bam, he's a Hall of Fame. But Vladimir Guerrero, Another guy that nobody, they didn't want him. One of the stories that I heard um, internally in the family is that, is that he came to practice um, with, he didn't have cleats. Cleats are baseball shoes. And he only had like church shoes, regular shoes. So they didn't allow him to play baseball. But Felipe said, let's give this guy a chance. And now he became one of the biggest players and as well as his son is actually playing right now and generations of players there. So. Um, Felipe, <clears throat> Felipe Alo is definitely a big, big um, component in the Dominican Republic. He makes sure everybody got an opportunity and he makes sure that his family um, got, um, got to play with so many different players coming in in, in, in the major leagues, okay? So Fa Felipe Alo pioneered his journey and he enabled the history of baseball, the Dominican Republic, and he was then also um, highlight the remarkable family of the Roa Salud family. Does anybody have any questions before I get started? I'm Dominican, so if I speak fast, you gotta tell me, you gotta let me know, okay? Come on in. Excellent. So <clears throat> the first chapter, all right? And we're gonna, and I, I just call it, it all started in El Doce de Jaina. All right, does everybody know where El Doce de Jaina is in the DR? Has there anyone ever been to El Doce de Jaina? No? It's a lovely place. Okay. It's in the capital, the capital region. Um, it's, it's going into a, the province of San Cristobal down, but El Doce is, is right there in the capital, but then, then you go into Jaina, Jaina. Um, and Jaina definitely, you know, had a lot of great successful baseball players and things, and, and very humble people that take pride in their work. And uh, another baseball player that came from there is David Ortiz. But we always have to remember the first that were, that got scouted and, and came to the U.S. was Felipe, okay? Before crossing Haina, was the Haina was nah. It was a city actually, uh, back in the, a long time ago. But he describes in the first <clears throat> in the first chapter uh, of growing growing up in Haina. And Felipe Alou in Haina, they call him El Panque de Haina. Don't know why they call him El Panque, but he was born 
and very loved still in, in that part of the Dominican Republic, which is considered the capital as well. He was born to Jose Albundio Altagracia Rojas, Jose Altagracia Rojas, but they call him Abundio. Um, does anybody know what Abundio means? Before we get into it. Okay. Abundance. Abundance. So that was a very, very cool nickname they gave for uh, a young man that lived his life um, honorably. And, um, and, and Felipe always felt very proud of his father. Even though his father was no baseball player or rich or things of that nature, he always lived with honor. Until this day, uh, when you go to, 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 you speak to any of the Rojas uh, family members, they always talk about the greatness of Abondio. Even my own, my grandmother is his cousin, um, which her name is Ana Altagracia Rojas, and she named her son Jose Altagracia Rojas because Abundio was so loved um, in the community. So Abundio uh, married Belinia Alu, Alu Reynoso, um, and Felipe was the third of the seven children, and he is the oldest of he is the oldest of the Alu children, which is Felipe. Uh, Maria, my dear Sula Alu, uh, Maddie Alu, um, <laughs> Juan Alu, and um, Virginia Alu, all right? He grew up, <clears throat> Haina at that time was very, very poor, so he grew up in, in poverty, but he was very rich with love uh, and with a lot of family in the Dominican Republic. His dream was to study and become a doctor, like I mentioned, to help the rest of his family and, and the community, all right? There was a lack of access to health healthcare and he wanted to be that person to really help. Um, he was very proficient in sports at a young age, um, since the kids will run around, fish, and help with their father with, uh, as a carpenter, all right? So those little things that he, that he got as a kid in terms of fishing, um, you know, also throwing rocks at the coconuts actually made him better as a better athlete. And, um, and that helped him a lot in terms of, of, of before he saw anyone play, they played for the love at this time. So we have to remember that this is in the 1930s and 40s when they were young, where there was no player of color. And the first player of color, which he, which he mentions in the book, which that, that really gave him an eye of, of baseball royalty and, and seeing that he could do it. You guys know who, can you guys recall who, who, he, who, who he admired? He ended the You No? Can you repeat the question? Who was the first baseball player of color um, that Felipe, many, many children around the world saw playing in the big leagues, playing in the major leagues. And this is someone that he saw practicing in the Dominican Republic, but he was not the Dominican Republic. No. Jackie oh, Robinson? No. Jackie Robinson. Yeah. So while, ja and while Jackie Robinson was working his way up, remember Jackie Robinson never thought so, even though kids now are, you know, from a young age, they know they want to be a professional athlete. They know they can be rich or they can do something. Um, for Jackie Robinson um, to get into baseball and have an opportunity was nerve wracking. And it's something new that he never admi uh, uh, imagined. So when he was climbing up the ranks in, in the minor leagues, they were practicing in the Dominican Republic as well. And the Dominican League was very big, right? Who has heard of the Dominican Winter League? We're like, um, you see like best, the best team to me of all time is the Escogido. Um, you got the Aguilas. Hold on, hold on. Mami, mire, él dijo que el mejor equipo son los escogidos. Mira, ¿quién está hablando mire, ahí? Dijo él, dijo que el mejor equipo son los escogidos, dijo él. Oh, sí. Oh, ¿Y el Licey? Eh, ahí está ella. ¿Dónde, dónde está? ¿Dónde queda el Licey? <laughs> no, Dime. ella es de Jaina, del 12 de Jaina. Ajá. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 que se you know, está soñando, she said, sorry. No, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually, it's, um, it's a big rivalry in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, 
we had one family member that betrayed us. Well, I'm not gonna say betrayed because just in case he sees us one day, then you know he's bigger than me. Uh, but he played, his father played, well, Hesu ended up playing one year with Lisey, I think. And, um, and then Mel Rojas Jr. played um, in Lisey as well. So we just, we always clowned them. But Escogido was the team, uh, the best team of the DR. You have, you also have people wearing the uh, Aguilas, Los Little Pollitos, um, which are people from the North um, that usually, you know, so every region had their own team. And um, so you, you barely saw baseball. So when kids were growing up, they were playing for the love of it uh, because, um, they, you know, that's the things that kids did at that time. And um, one of the things that I always known and, and before the chapter started is that they highlighted, um, I, I call her my favorite person in, in the whole family, other than my mom and my grandmother, Sulalo. Uh, which is Felipe's um, sister, which is the second. Uh, they, they always mention that she could have made it to the big leagues. And um, one of the things that I love about understanding their childhood is that it was so it was great and pure, but she was raised with among boys. And um, to this day, she's like 80. Well, I don't want to put a number on her because she, I don't know if, you know if she watches this, I don't want any problems with her either, but she is still has that enthusiasm. Her granddaughter still plays and she's in like the upper west side little league and she you see her like 80 something. So that's a strikeout argument with the empire. So it's 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 lovely to see the enthusiasm because of the love of it. And what I was mentioning about Jackie Robinson, he grew up just loving the game and got the opportunity. And he knew that he had every person of color on his back. All right. So when we say that, that was happening the same way with Felipe, all right? And we're gonna talk about why did that manifest? How his, how those, how the universe manifested that to make sure he can get into that, that, um, that direction because the Cuban revolution played a big part of that. And we're gonna take the historical context. Um, the elimination of a baseball player that opened up that door because Felipe went in play, running track in college, right? So what did you got, what, everybody read the book? No? Wow. I was like halfway through. So you, you, should, you should be able to get the first chapter. So I'm just saying how lovely the first chapter is. So he described his childhood being pure and it gave you a, a visualize of how living in the capital was at that time. This is why I loved the first four chapters. His, his book was very fluey and I love that about it. He he named everyone that big played a big part in his life, and one of the things is that as a kid, um, yeah, he would play baseball with his brothers and his sister, and you know, all the kids in the neighborhood. Being his sister was his sister Sula was one of the best pitchers that that they would play, and at that time, women did not get a lot of women did not get a lot of opportunities to. Uh, like little girls, they, they always wanted you to be at home and things of that nature. So they, one story that she gave me, this is not in the book, is that she will play and she'll make sure she'll dominate against her brothers, especially her little brother, Maddie Alou, which is in the picture. Um, that, that his mom, his fa her, her, her father, Babundio, always wanted to make sure that she was girly, clean all the time. So they will have to rush home to clean her up. Um, if she got scratched, you know, you know, make sure that she was good so then they don't all get in trouble. So they played for the love of it, even if um, they got in trouble. Um, but a lot of things in his childhood of, you know, even though they were poor, they were, they were extremely grateful. And one of the things is that they were able to fish. Fishing was a big thing, as well as helping their father um, with the uh, uh, carpentry. So these little skills helped him in terms of like, you know, you know, hammering, throwing um, rocks at the coconuts, playing every day, fishing because it helped him with his patience, really helped him in the long term. Okay. But during this time is the Trujillo era. How do you think that affected uh, and how he viewed politics that played a big part in his, you know, growing up? How, how do you think it was living? How do you think it was living in, in the Trujillo era? Anybody want to try? 
from what I know, at least from my parents, it just was not easy. Is that you had a caste system in place. You knew who got favoritism, especially when people were growing up. And then there was basically racism there too, where you had the light skins versus dark skinned Dominicans. And it was, it wasn't great. Like, you know, and yeah, I'll stop there. But I, I know from my family now they told me everything. So yeah. Any, thank you so much, Denny. Um, anybody else wants to chime in? Uh, he ex he expressed a lot of that in the book. My um, uncle also told me. Oh, sorry. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Uh, thank you. My uncles also told me that Trujillo didn't want like people to leave the island like with their talents. So he told me like si era un pelotero like él quería que tú te quedara aquí a jugar like he didn't want you to go like to the extranjero to play. So I didn't get to finish the entire book, but what I read so far, um, it was really good because I've been able to talk to some members of my family and they were like, yeah, for a lot of those players, it was unfair because he didn't want them to leave. Like he wanted them to stay here. He sort of hacían imposible for them to leave because um, he wanted the talent to stay here, right? In the country. Yep, that's very true. And that, I remember when, when I mentioned that how everything, everything, it was a game of chance. It was not a game of chance, it was a chance. Right, everything that happened in his life to be the first player to be recruited and scouted um, uh, and scouted was, was, is because of that. So one player complained and he did not want, he, while they were outside in the Pan, Pan American games, they eliminated that player and they didn't have anyone else to put, but they saw how Felipe Alou was so fast on the track and he was, he was available. They said, you know what, let's put Felipe to play. He did so well there that it, they put all the, they highlighted his talent. And then from there he moved up. And that coach ended up having a connection with this, the New York Giants before it became San Francisco, the New York Giants. All right, for all my New Yorkers are here, do you know what the New York Giants stadium used to be? Yes, <laughs> Polo Grounds, 155th and Edgecombe. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say the address, but damn. <laughs> go, go Washington Heights. That's how I go. go Washington Heights. So yeah, so it was in in Washington Heights, and um, uh, so when he that that scout and the elimination of that player, uh, it allowed them to look at Felipe. Also, at this time, the Cuban Revolution was happening, and while Felipe was at school. Felipe, well, his main, my main thing was to become a doctor. Uh, be, the scout saw that all the scouting went into looking at players in the Dominican Republic because they could not look at players in, in Cuba anymore. All right, so that whole thing was shifting. So while thing, you think things are not moving for you, it's just moving all, all around you and it just it came in place. All right, so the elimination of that player, the Cuban revolution and that whole thing that's happening allow uh, the Americans to say, hey, let's take a look at um, the Dominican Republic. And from there, that scout was one of his coaches, his running uh, coach, and he said, hey, I have a young man that you may want to see, all right? Felipe got really fast as a kid, even though his father didn't have a car for a long time. And sometimes he would have to run, um, especially growing up in that time, you didn't have your cell phone to, to understand the weather. So to go to school, um, sometimes he had to walk two miles, but sometimes he will under, he'll see that the rain is coming, so he will have to run home. So everybody in certain neighborhoods say, hey, look, it's Felipe running. Again, that's a young man that's always running. And that made him even quicker every, every day and being part of the track team. So that made him very appealing to, 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 to the young scouts as having, having Felipe as an option, all right? What do you think, in the book it mentions on when the scout approached his, his parents on, hey, quit school in med medical school to come up, become a baseball player. What do you think happened there? And what was the hesitancy of, of that? Anybody wants to chime in? Um, I liked that part. I felt like, I feel like when you read stories where people like, make it or whatever that you always see like oh my family was super supportive and I liked the realistic 
like if, if it was my life, I think it'd be like that. I think if it was a lot of Dominicans' lives, it'd be like that, where their parents would be like, well, no, that's not realistic. You need an actual job. You're not going to be doing this. So I thought that part was kind of funny. Yes, it, that that's um, that's something that I, I felt I felt the tension just reading that part. Does anybody else want to chime in? So so think about the the scout had the, so the scout ended up seeing the talents that Felipe has, right? And the other thing is that battling the what Trujillo and Trujillo definitely did not want his players and his people the best talents to be leaving as well. So it was a lot of challenges where easily they made uh, Abundio say, uh, you're gonna leave school to become a baseball player. At that time, baseball players were not making millions, all right? This is not, and, and they didn't see that as a real profession, all right? So him taking that leap was a big leap of faith that he never, he would never really imagine the impact he will have. And the impact being, his two brothers ended up being in the major leagues as well. Most of the family ended up being in, in the US. Um, he played in the Yankees, became the first Dominican coach. Just taking that little small leap, it opened up the door, all right? So we're gonna talk about the, the trials and tribulations of you know, coming into the US. You know, in the US, we don't think that's gonna, you know, I feel like Dominicans, I, I feel like uh, Mariela, she, she's over there in the DR. Um, but I feel that I just came back from there. They think that, you know, everybody's rich. Like, you know, when it's raining, it doesn't rain water, it rains uh, money. And um, that, that wasn't the case uh, to, um, for Felipe. When Felipe came in to the United States in, at, in Louisiana, in the South, during Jim Crow. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yes, even his son. So we're gonna talk about all of that. Even his son played, his other son became the coach, was just the coach of the Mets. You know, it, it, it's a lot. And it's a, it's a lot of people that you may not know, uh, a lot of talent uh, that was developed there, okay? So I think his, his upbringing in, 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 in Dose, which that's how we call it over here, and those being his upbringing from when Dose really helped him, um, you know, hone his skills, um, develop the character that he has. One thing that people always mention about Felipe Alo is that he always felt that he was representing his family. And once he became in the major leagues, he felt that he was representing Dominicans worldwide. All right. So there was a lot of sacrifices that he did and that to make sure that he didn't make the Dominicans look bad. Okay. So I will be going into the next few chapters. Nobody has any questions? Nobody likes the pictures I chose? All right, so this is Felipe, his little brother Mate, Mateito, and Jesus, right? So he was destined for greatness. That's what I call the next three or four chapters. Uh, when Felipe Alo arrived to Louisiana to play in the minor leagues, all right, there was a big journey in the minor leagues uh, where he faced a level of racism, all right? He read about racism. Remember, he, 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 he saw the, the struggles that Jackie Robinson, which is one of his idols, um, faced in the, in, the, in, in the United States. But he never thought that he would experience that type of racism that he saw in books, all right? But also, in Dominican culture, there's a lot of, into, uh, it's very, um, a lot of, it's a lot of mixing. Okay, so when he came in, he, his mother, um, his mother um, was from Spain. So he didn't, didn't understand why he was being hated or why he would have to sit in the back um, because he just saw people as people, all right? So now he had to understand um, being a, a Afro-Latino, um, a, a, a Latin person of African descent, um, he understood um, the camaraderie because he had to really come together with the Puerto Rican players. When we're going to talk about Roberto Clemente, who knows who's Roberto Clemente? 
Yes. Okay. We got the hand up. Okay. Um, he, he's, he, he, he teams up with Roberto Clemente. We have also other Dominican players like Rico Cardi, which, that, which is from San Pedro de Macorís, which um, if people look at him, people would not know that he was Dominican, especially with the last name Cardi. Okay. So when, I, when Felipe got to the US, uh, many people did not know about what was Dominican Republic. All right, you, it, so this is when I tell folks in my class, because I teach a class at CUNY at BMCC, is that if many Dominicans that may not feel um, connected to the African diaspora, I was like, you might, wa you might wanna think that again, all right? Because if you are working in the fields and they catch you, you're not gonna tell them, I'm so sorry, my friend, I'm Dominican. No, they're gonna put you back in the field, all right? So he noticed when he came into the US, um, uh, he had to introduce and represent the Dominican people um, um, to, to, to what the culture was. And many people were very surprised that he was uh, a black man that did not speak any English, all right? So that played a big, big challenge for him, all right? So just think about if you come to the, uh, the United States, uh, with very little uh, understanding of the culture, as well as a lot of limitations, which is the Jim Crow um, era, which they kept black uh, people, uh, black Americans, as well as white Americans separated. You had to be really, it, it was very nerve wracking. I can just put, when reading this book, um, especially in the third chapter, I can just tell how nerve wracking it was for him. But he was fearless, all right? And he knew he was there to help his family make enough money and then he was thinking about going back, but everything kind of worked out for him, all right? What, what, do you, what do you, when you guys read that chapter, how did you feel, or can you put yourself in that, in the Jim Crow era? Oh, yes. Um, let's say so. uh, I kind of wrote it in the chat, but this chapter, I think for me was such a, it was a really big one because most people I hear that are Dominican, usually I meet, they came in the 90s and my family came around at that time. And so there's like stories of, um, you know, my grandmother was black and she would go to a store or a restaurant and be like, oh, I don't know why they're not serving me. I'm here for a thousand years and nobody's, um, you know, coming to, like they, they didn't have that segregation that they had in the Jim Crow. So reading this, it was, it, it like gave that more context you know, like you're coming and then, and especially he was down in like Louisiana, which is even more, more intense. Yeah. And, and in, in the book, it's it also mentioned um, that it was a lot more intense because the governor of, of the state and the mayor and the, all the politicians at that time were very pro segregation. All right. So with a leap of faith, um, everything kind of worked out for him because they transferred him to a team in Florida, all right? In Florida, even though they had um, still Jim Crow was still um, evident there, it was a lot less lenient uh, than in Louisiana, all right? So he started climbing up the ranks as well as they had other players of uh, Latin, Latin descent, all right? You had a, a Cubano in that team, and you had a, 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 a player, a minor league player that was from Puerto Rico that it helped him with his, with his English, okay? Uh, Felipe Alo was a very, very intelligent man that knew he had to prepare himself. So he started learning how to speak English and trying to learn how to read so he could move forward, okay? This is something that I enjoyed about in the book that he, he took little steps and he did not let uh, anything deter him. Right. He always knew in the beginning, especially in this stage, that he had a lot of people that was rooting for him, all right? And um, he had to always send money back home, okay? Does anybody have any questions so far? Just imagine you, you, um, you, <clears throat> you're in your, the way you see in the Dominican Republic, everybody was living in harmony all different races, you can go to any restaurant, and then you come to the United States, they say that you can't eat here, you have to eat in the back or across the street, um, and now understanding what's going on, especially not being able to speak English, all right? So, so 
Some people could get a, a gun pulled out on them. Then I hate what's going on. Que pasa? Yo, yo tengo hambre. And, and, that, and that's how him working his way up was something, a testament of his hard work. All right. So in Florida, he had the opportunity to shine and to display his hard work. So he started being a, the difference he mentioned about players in the Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, um, versus the American players is that uh, Latin players would attack the ball, all right? And they never seen a hitter like that. He was very aggressive on the plate. And he started being a person that they saw that he was a great um, batter, all right? And once he started batting and, and had any, and really exceeding expectation, they moved him up and they kept moving him up until he, he made it to the San Francisco Giants. When the Giants moved from New York, they went to San Francisco and he made it into their debut, okay? Him doing so good and, and he, he was able to open up the doors for other Dominican players where they started looking at Rico Cardi that came around that at that time and other players as well. Right, like Javier, um, that came in. Does anybody have any any questions? I, I really love the uh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I'm. I would like to do one one question that when you was talking about, um, uh, why, uh, why the America or U.S. league takes a lot of. Um, players from the Dominican Republic right now, or on the time before. Um, my question is, uh, is, is, uh, qué, uh, si, um, why is, um, how many players from Dominican Republic come into play later in, uh, in US? If maybe in the time of the segregation or something like that, there are so many problems with the African American that play it as well at the uh, major leagues. Um, what happened is because the Dominican player or Latin player costs less, or or why? So that, that, that's an excellent question. Um, and there, and I was going to get into the so. He had a, a, I could quote that in the book that it stood in my mind, that Americans were considered first class. They don't look at black Americans as second class and Latin players always fall as third class. Why? Because they, there was a class between the African-American players and, and the uh, Latin players, okay? And that being is because they were, the people, they took lesser contracts. So they cost less. And we're gonna, we're gonna, there's a chapter in the book, I forgot which chapter, probably six, chapter six, where Felipe fought for the, the Bill of Rights of Latin players, all right? And, and, and we're gonna talk about the courage it took because he was, he was very vocal. He could have got kicked out of the league and said, we're gonna get another one. And um, so he organized a strike. He organized everything in that part to get paid um, equally, uh, not just as the African American players, he wanted everybody to get paid equally by their talent. But at that time, yes, there was a, they started looking at Puerto Rican players, Cuban players at first, because they were said they do cheaper, uh, and then Dominican players. Uh, by the 70s, they noticed that the Dominican Republic had major talent. And um, that's what things started changing. It, it was all about the money. It was a cheaper cost. Excellent question. Thank you. I, I can imagine. Yeah, you answer very well. Another question is, I think so. Uh, is, yeah. <laughs> Gracias. Um, it's not about um, the Felipe Alo story. It's uh, that when you was, uh, was talking, I remember the Dodgers exist yet or not. They, the Dodgers existed. Um, they also started in Brooklyn and then they ended up moving to LA. Uh, and they definitely had their share of Dominican players as well, like Manny Mota, uh, which is a very close friend of the Alou family. 
Yep, and fun fact, just one final thing. When you look at the colors of the New York Mets, the colors are actually the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yep. If you didn't know that. Yep. That's that's a very good fact. Um, I don't know if people knew that, but that was, you know, to make sure that people we, when the New York lost that those two teams, they thought that they needed another team. So let's go Mets. Um, anybody have any questions of his up? You know, just coming up in the in the in the world of baseball. Um, him being a a Latin player of color. Um, that was. They, uh, the only reason why I mentioned that as well is because they had a Cuban player. He he always mentioned Felipe in the beginning. This was a very frustrating time for him, all right, when he was playing in the minor leagues. And the Latin player, I just forgot his name in the book because he was throwing so many names. He, he said he would pass. He was white passing. So people thought he was white, so he was able to get away with things. So he would tell them to relax, you know, um, you know be patient. You're very good to throw it all the way and, and mess up the future. So, you know, if he was, if he looked a little bit more, he had better privileges, that player. But when you start seeing dark-skinned Latinos like Roberto Clemente and Felipe, that were very proud, proud um, um, people. Um, and one of the books that I've read of Roberto Clemente being is that he will get mad if anybody tries to eat at certain restaurants. So he made sure that everybody ate in the, the restaurants where they were accepted. So they, he'll make sure that even though we're gonna be hungry, we're not gonna eat in your restaurant because you're gonna have us on your back. So you losing the money that we getting. And the, you know, so they were very proud in terms of organizing. And that's where we're gonna start talking about um, um, the organizing of uh, and how the media uh, played a big part. You guys, do you guys get to that that chapter of Roberto Clemente? Yeah. So Roberto Clemente was a very, very influential, uh, a man of honor. I wish, I, I, that's the the guy I always aspired to be. Like, just a guy, of, you know, just stand up for anything and and always help his people. So we're gonna get into those chapters now. But before he, after he left the Florida. Uh, minor league team he worked his way up and kept hitting and hitting because he noticed that he got recognition of being the top hitter in, in the minor leagues all right he he made it to that league so fast that while he was in the Dominican Republic they gave him a call in San Francisco Giants said we want you to be our next um, player even though Bill Hill was already in and and played a year before him um Felipe was uh, the most common name after that, um, the Alou family, okay? So we're gonna go into, into that now, all right? So this is an image of Felipe making it to the Giants. Um, he became a rising star player in a, in a, in a career that, that people look back and say, hey, this guy really, really lived, fought hard and also, um, Fall hard as well as um, understood that he was a trailblazer, right? Uh, many of us may never understand what that can ent entails, knowing that any, any bad mistake that you could make could really deter the future of everyone be, um, after you, all right? And that, and that made him a big leader, um, knowing that being such a leader and being a great player, because you could be a leader if you're a leader and you're not backing it up in terms of your work ethic, um, it kind of tramples. So he always had to be on top of his game, move the right way, and um, being able to, to be an example. And that's what made it easier for Mateo, Matty Alou, to come in after him, all right? So he started in the, in the Giants before getting traded to, to the Braves and later the Yankees and Oakland A's. Um, but during his time as a giant, he ended up meeting Roberto Clemente. And Roberto Clemente, the, the way he, he mentioned in the book, he had a whole section on Roberto Clemente of his influence, all right? Uh, if, if you consider Felipe being a proud man, 
Roberto Clemente was a very, very proud man that he just didn't care, all right? He's like, I can go back to Puerto Rico any day. If you guys want to kick me out, I don't care, all right? Because at this time, you start seeing the issues with Latin players, all right, in this chapter. And in this chapter, you, you see that even if they have the top um, numbers, they will not win MVP. They're like, wow, how come we, not, we didn't get MVP and they give it to, you know, player, um, you know, there was one time that Mickey Mattel, even though he's a Yankee legend, one of the best legends, Roberto Clemente had better numbers. And Roberto Clemente's statistics as a baseball player was on another level, all right? I, and I'm not trying to put down the Alou family, that's, that's family, but all of them put together didn't have <laughs> Roberto Clemente's numbers. So if he's complaining about why then I not win MVP, and he will be vocal. Um, and his influence in terms of always, this is what, what, I, what I admire the most, is that um, he always wanted to give back. Anything that he did, he's like, hey, there's a charity event. Let's go, boom, boom, let's give back. Um, one thing that he mentioned, uh, oh, she got the picture in the back. <laughs> I, I was looking for it to find it. <laughs> I, I love it, I love it. Um, he, he, um, so when Roberto started showing that you can give back and be good with the people, you started, you, 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 you're good with the people, it actually it shows you in a different light, all right? And Roberto Clemente will invite the Dominican players. And, and one thing about the Winter League is that, <clears throat> is that they will create um, opportunities for the players that play in the major leagues to go back home in Puerto Rico and, and, and the Dominican Republic. So then the players there can also make money and then the people can eat. Even though Felipe usually did not make a cent, um, like he mentioned in the book, he made sure it gave back to the people. But Roberto Clemente always spoke out, even if it had to be on, on African-American issues and um, and Latin American players' issues, he wanted to make sure he, he voiced his opinion, all right? Uh, because there was a lot of media attack, especially on Roberto Clemente and then Felipe as well, all right? So one of the things is that since their Spanish was not as great at that time, um, the media will write, I heat the ball. So they'll put H-E-E-E-T knowing that they're saying, I hit the ball, right? So he felt that that was a slap in his face. It was disrespectful and they will always speak on it. And they would, um, they wanted to make sure that Latin American players were heard and then they could also keep their culture. Just because they're playing baseball, they didn't feel that they would need it to be dominated um, by, you know, the system. And that was in, <clears throat> in that time, all right? So they refuse to talk to the media at times, or they'll let them, or they'll speak in Spanish. So I don't know if you guys ever seen when, when uh, Roberto Clemente won the championship. He's like, hey, I know you guys don't like me to speak in Spanish, but for mi gente en Puerto Rico, blah, 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 and he said, and, and everybody looked down, you can't do that in national TV in the 60s. They didn't care. So to, to do that at that time, um, it really, it really was um, a lot of courage, all right? <clears throat> Especially in a time where in the other island, which is PR, Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba, Cuban players did not have, at this moment, it was very tough for them, all right? So there was a few um, Cuban players that, that even the Spanish language at that time um, was an issue for the media and many, and I forgot the manager in the Giants that he mentioned. Um, his last name was Dark, all right? Alvin Dark. Alvin Dark, yes. So he mentioned that, and one time he pulled all the Giants players together in center field and said, you know what? You're banned from playing, oh, you're banned from speaking Spanish once you get into the stadium, right? That didn't deter Felipe or Orlando Cepeda as well as Roberto Clemente to be like, huh? They literally even spoke more Spanish because they said like, you're not gonna tell us uh, to diminish our culture. And that's something that, that it was started, 
yeah, that was also my favorite parts as well. That was, that was something that resonated in terms of um, that, that really did not, did not sit right with players that did not want to know about the Latin um, influx of Latin players, all right? So they fought back in terms of getting respect from the media, in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of being properly um, represented, um, also being allowed to get the accolades. So there was not, a, there was not a, of course there was athletic rivalry, but they all worked together. And they knew that Felipe knew if Roberto's doing great, Roberto would want Felipe to do great and, and, and also with the Cuban players. So at one time they made sure that everybody succeeded in their own teams. Um, that when Mateo Alo, his little brother played in Pittsburgh with Roberto, he had his best years where, where they won the batting title. So if you look at all the stats in one year, it would be, it would be Mateo, Felipe, Rico Cardi. Roberto Clemente, so every player that you saw that was on the top, that you can't say they can't win the MVP or, or any awards, it was undeniable to, to respect um, these players of, from the Caribbean and or in Latin descent. All right, so they worked together, they came together to make sure that they could continue um, having a path and being more respected in, in the major leagues. I know I'm speaking a lot. Does anybody have any questions? How do you guys felt when, when that manager Alvin Dark, um, Alvin Dark, um, um, mentioned that they they are not allowed to speak Spanish um, during games uh, or to each other in practice or anywhere close to the stadium? How how, how do you think that that you would have felt during that time and, and their response. What, what do you got? I would love to hear your perspective on that. I'll share. Yes. I could assume that they were afraid of not knowing what they were talking about, like they do today. We still get that, that if we speak Spanish in certain places, those who know, don't know the language and you know who those people are will tell you speak English. Um, because they're usually afraid of what you're talking of. And if you're saying something behind their back or offending them and they don't know what you're saying. Um, and I can only imagine that the players felt horrible too because you're attached to your language, right? That's part of who you are. And to be told that you can't be who you are in, in all of its authenticity, it's hurtful. Absolutely. Um, oh, that's too. I feel like it's, it's like a racial cowardice because if they were all speaking French, nobody would nobody would give a damn, you know? Cause it's like, oh, it's French, but it's Spanish, it's lower, it's black, it's brown, it's not okay. I personally love the part where they just started speaking louder. Cause like, so I grew up very like more around Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. So I always felt a bit like out of place and reading that part made me laugh. Cause I was always like, like that as a person. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. It's cultural, so I'm, I'm good. I, I loved it. They, I love how like they were just, no, I don't think so. We're going to do it and we're going to speak even louder and you're going to deal with it. Absolutely. I mean, and, and remember Felipe's response in the, in the book is that how is he going to explain to his, he's always thinking about his father. So he's like, how am I going to explain to my father that I can't speak to my brother that just came from the Dominican Republic that I can't speak to him in Spanish? Like, it sounds crazy. And uh, or explaining to his brother, Mateo, uh, that he can't speak to him in Spanish while he's in the stadium and he understand, he's, uh, un he's not understanding what's going on. Um, you know what's ironic? Can I? Yes. What's ironic right now is that the major leagues is trying to teach their players Spanish because they realize how little communication there is between coaching staff, between players and between the front office and players. Um, the Marlins, and Derek Jeter, to his credit, is now mandating that everybody learn Spanish. So, you know, 50 years later, look where we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that example. So, yeah, so people, they see the wave of that and they, you know, they, they emphasize in terms of, of 
of um, the importance of it. But back then, they were diminishing the culture. Felipe makes sure that he'll never forget his people and his culture, right? Believe it or not, every time he, he got out of the season, he went into the Dominican Baseball League, all right? He didn't have to do that. And we're going to talk about how that went into building the Latin Players Bill of Rights, all right? So while all of this is happening with the media, when the media is also called them at one time, Philip Alou, and they call Roberto Bob Clemente. There's some baseball card, do you see that? He's like, you're not gonna call me Bob. <laughs> he said in an interview, actually that's on, that's on YouTube somewhere, like, that Bob Clemente is like, my name is not Bob, okay? My name is Roberto, like on TV, you know? Yeah, it's so, so more marketable. And, and Felipe like, hey, my name is not Philip, my name is Felipe. Like, you're not gonna change me. Because the first thing that happened to him when he couldn't speak the language is that his last name is really Rojas, all right? And when he got into the United States with the little Spanish, that, the little English that he barely knew any, anything and he didn't know where he was going and they see the two last names, all right? He, he felt that he, they, put, they put F Alu. If he knew at that time, he would have just left it as Rojas, all right? Um, even though he mentioned that his father didn't really have a major issue with it. Uh, it all, it's always something that's always um, changed the dynamic in terms of their name, okay? Even though his last name, his name is originally Felipe Rojas. Hello. All right, so, you know, that felt like he was diminishing a little bit of his culture and he wanted to make sure that he, he represented it at all time high. So uh, during this time when they left, um, the major leagues playing 162 games, he'll go back to the Dominican probably. And one of the things I always found remarkable in the book is that the Dominican League, they also had a Cuban League, um, as well as the, the Puerto Rican League, um, that they wanted to lift up their leagues and make sure that everybody ate. Just because you're not in the, in the I, I love the, the, the humbleness in, in Felipe where he could have easily got, said, hey, I'm gonna take a break. I've been working all year, you guys. No, he came and played for the best team in the Dominican team, the Escogidos, Escogido. Um, whoever, you know, whoever wants to debate me, uh, we, can, we can schedule that. Um, he, he wanted to make sure that they also got exposure. And with that exposure also built the Dominican League where we see it today, where people come there. And people actually go straight from that league to the major leagues. So him, him being the trailblazer that he is, he also helped uh, his folks back in the Dominican Republic. All right? And helping other Latin American countries as well, playing against the Cubans and playing in Puerto Rico against Orlando Cepede uh, and um, Roberto Clemente. All right? Does anybody have any questions? No. All right. So Roberto Clemente's influence uh, was major. I want. I actually want to go back to that. Uh, Roberto Clemente's way of giving back. I mean, he died giving back. Does anybody know how he passed away? Um, I see Princess holding her hand up. Sorry, I always <laughs> raise my hand. <laughs> um, Shame. I, yeah. Even, uh, it, it was like a plane to Managua because there was a, um, I, what do you call it? There was an earthquake and then they were giving out, they were giving out supplies and relief stuff and the government was like trying to take advantage of it and take it and hoard it. And so he was like, no, I'm going to make sure that it gets delivered. And just after it took off, the plane crashed and like mysteriously crashed. So anybody else wants to chime in? Yeah, I just add that when he died, he died with exactly 3,000 hits um, for his career, I believe. Yeah, I think it was exactly 3,000 hits. So he just finished completing that milestone. And yeah, and everybody know like how great he was. He was, he was a man, you know? Uh, he was a humanitarian. He really focused on that, always driving it. And you already touched upon it, so I'm not gonna repeat all of it, but he was just, a, he was this man. He always looked up to him. Same thing if you followed baseball. I'm sure, everybody knows here. He looked up to him. He followed it, everything that Roberto Clemente did, and 
that's who you want to mimic and all your parents tell you this, this is the guy, you know, this is the guy that everybody looked up to. Mm-hmm. That's it. But the irony is that <clears throat> when he, while he was alive, a lot of people didn't like him. Um, and one of the things that he will say, and, and that, that's one of my favorite, that was my favorite section in the book when he talks about his relationship with Philippe, um, with Roberto, where he said that being a baseball player is not the biggest thing in the world. He's like, I'm bigger than just baseball. Uh, I want to help everybody. And he, he, uh, Felipe, he felt that. And he felt that him being the first Dominican taken, um, scouted from the Dominican public, he wanted to make sure everybody ate. And that's what he did. Um, and every, and he, he looked out for the next generation, uh, e- even to have rights, all right? So yeah, Roberto Clemente was a humanitarian, uh, humongous humanitarian that he got up uh, during the winter break uh, and he went to make sure, well, he, is, if anybody has ever given, given donations to big organizations, you know that they're gonna take a, a cut and things of that nature. He wanted to make sure all the supplies that he provided go straight to the people. So he got in that airplane um, and that airplane didn't, um, didn't even make it, it was still on like the shores of Puerto Rico. Um, but yeah, Roberto Clemente lived live more, he lived for the people. Um, uh, so his influence really had a, had a big influence on, on, on Felipe. So with the issues of the Dominican League, uh, Major League Baseball wanted to, because we're gonna talk about the politics that was happening at this time. Because of everything that's happening in Cuba with Fidel Castro, and also the dangers of a baseball player um, getting injured during the winter league, uh, they they were started to find many baseball players, especially Felipe. They started finding him. They said that if he plays in the winter league, they will find him. And he's like, he still played. He's like, I'm not paying that fine. You can find me. And he fought that fine to the end because he wanted to make sure that led into leading the land uh, players full of rights. And then there's a lot of rights they were fighting for, all right? When you think about a baseball player, uh, you think about, you think that they're all rich. At this time, they were not really making that much money, all right? At this time, there were certain baseball players that had second jobs, all right? Um, so it's a, the Winter League allowed them to make a little bit more money, of course, and also <clears throat> build the league, but he wanted to make sure that they got paid equally like everyone else, like the American players, right? Black or white, he wanted to make sure that they had the opportunity to have the rights as well as have workers' rights, as well as be, being able to play in the winter league as well. And he led that. And that's something that while you're risking your whole livelihood, you're risking your whole citizenship uh, at that time, uh, to stay in the U.S., you're risking everything. To and one thing that he mentioned that there was not a lot of jobs in the Dominican Republic, so he knew that if <clears throat> if he did not make it, or they they cut him, uh, or got rid of him, or banned him from Major League Baseball, he would have to be in the Dominican Republic and figure out going back to school or getting a job that he knew that he was not going to pay for. There was he would not get paid. Plus he had just had uh, his first born, which is Maria, de, I'm not gonna say her full name, she's a very quiet person, but Maria, um, she's very tall, I don't want to brief. Um, that he knew he had kids and a family that he had to maintain. So that's a lot of guts and a lot of risks that he took, um, it took in play for Felipe. And Felipe was successful to lead the player, uh, the lab players full of rights. Find that amazing. So during this time that everything's happening, there was a lot of trouble and it was trouble in his heart. All right, especially in the Dominican Republic. All right, there was assassination of the dictator. All right, I didn't speak too much about the dictator um, and when he first started, but people will whisper. He, he, he painted that image in the first two chapters of that his father and people in the, in the, in the community will get, um, they will light up the candle and listen to the radio, listen on how, you know, about Trujillo and living during that Trujillo era, 
can any, anybody wants to say anything like e even like some through your policies or things that you had to live through while was through he was alive if you were a woman and he wanted you then that was it i mean yeah that's that's one of the things that they mentioned as well yeah anybody else wants to want to chime in i like talking I'll talk to you guys. <laughs> one thing, one thing is that he wanted everybody to have a picture of the way you in, 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 in their household. Or if they heard you speak ill about the dictator, you you can disappear. Something can happen. Um, so and Trujillo was also from San Cristobal, which is not that far from Haina, you know. So it's um it really hit home in terms of of yeah uh in the in the book yeah it said that no one was even allowed to have a bible um until a certain age um, um so Trujillo was really controlling the minds um this is something that i speak very thoroughly in, in my classes in, at cuny the city university of new york where the Trujillo era was the bloodiest era Right, uh, many people were, uh, you know, were assassinated. Many people were uh, went missing uh, because of political differences. All right, uh, and you can speak uh, in ill of him. All you see the banda fronteros come to your house. The black cars come to your house, and many women were uh, unfortunately targeted. Uh, so, and so he he never seen. He, during his time, Trujillo took power in, in, in 19, uh, 1931, uh, in 1930, I'm sorry, uh, to 1961. So during his whole life, Trujillo was always the head of the Dominican Republic. Now the death of the dictator happened, right? The assassination of the, he knew that baseball in America, they will also will keep an eye in the Dominican Republic. That big, played a big part for all the Dominican players in all Dominicans in New York City, uh, in, New in the United States. Why? Because during this time, the Dominican Republic went in shambles. It was a lot of scrambling in terms of what's gonna happen next, all right? And they had a number of leaders that stepped up. And one of them was Juan Bosch, which was more connected to the social democratic vision of, of the island, all right? He came from Cuba. I mean, he's Dominican, but he was living a few years in Cuba. And when he came in, the Americans were nervous of having a second Cuba, all right? So this played a plagued a lot in terms of the Dominican baseball, Major League Baseball, and also the heart, his heart said, hey, I'm torn of what's happening um, to my country, all right? If anybody read, you, you just noticed that even though he was in the United States, he was always in the Dominican Republic in his heart, all right? And seeing what people were going through. So after the death of the dictator, scrambles with Balaguer taking power. I mean, Ramfis, the, the son of um, Trujillo, he was put in in the beginning and then it just had a changes until they had an election and Juan Bosch ended up winning, all right? And all that, this political drama played a big part, all right? Going into a civil war uh, in the DR because of the changes of the constitution, all right? Does everybody, is everybody aware of this, the Dominican Civil War in the 60s, 1965? No? Oh. Yes. Yeah, I hear that, sorry. I, yeah. I, my, my mom told me about that because my mom was uh, um, follow the ideology of one watch at that time and uh, uh, socialistic, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, they she told me about that that time. And what one thing that I would like to to share is that uh, reading something just a little bit about the Trujillo era is was that uh, one I think so I don't know if I'm, I'm correct, but when uh, he was in a power, he is in his family. Uh, they. Uh, have the, pro, pro, the the he he was the owner of everything practically, 
And this is what I think so that the other countries take the, take a, a start to look in just a little bit more uh, from here, from, from see uh, about him, because uh, uh, while the people was very, very poor, uh, the family, Trujillo family had uh, a lot of things. House that uh, was the pro, uh, the owner of all the 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 I don't know how to say todas las fábricas, todas la, las empresas, sí. de todo. Yeah. Even I think so. Even now they have uh, a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even now. I remember my parents. I remember my parents telling me that it was like that signs or my grandparents told me that signs everywhere where it was uh dios y Trujillo. Yeah. so the only two people that mattered were those two that's it um, yeah. no it's uh very true thank you um karina it's very, karina and, uh, and denny that is very true it's um it's the way that he maintained power so in 1930 um you know i don't want to get no emails after this like oh stop talking about my man Trujillo. But look, it's um, <laughs> it's the it's the truth in terms of um, the way he was able to control the people at that time. It was similar to a cult because he made sure that in the radio you would hear everything about the radio. All right, so think about being in the radio and you hear the radio is the greatest, right? But then he owns the industries. So before 1931, um, you had. You had Vasquez, Horacio Vasquez, and you had a number, and then the, the U.S. intervent, the first one was there, where the, the, the Dominican people were in heavy poverty. As soon as Trujillo came in, of course, things got better financially, and they've never seen a level of stability um, when Trujillo was there. So if you had businesses, you'd think that you're getting your money directly from Trujillo. Trujillo is saving you, and that's how the type of things that he was doing at that time. So many people were kind of um, were followers, not just uh, people that supported Trujillo at that time. So it was a major change. Um, but one thing that <clears throat> Abundio, it says in the book, is that he would sit down with the family and not say too much in terms of how he felt, but he was like, this guy's incredible. This guy, and not, not in a good way. He's like, this guy, he's really damaging the people, right? So when he saw the change in the death of the, of the, of the dictator and, and where the country was going and while he was playing baseball, Felipe, in the 60s, he noticed that there was a civil war, all right? So Juan Bosch represented a new constitution, all right? The, not, the new constitution was very social democratic. We were very socially heavy. And then there were the loyalists that were loyal to the old way of things. So many of the young people were for the new constitution because they've never seen anything like that. They always seen that will help the people that were in the middle and, and, and working class uh, rather than people on the top, all right? And they wanted to make sure it could, it could uh, pass wealth. But during this time in 1961, if you know in 1959, Fidel Castro did the revolution and Fidel Castro in 1961 was talking crazy, the Bay of Pigs. He was talking crazy. So I'm, I'm going to give you an, an analogy. It's like a guy that just got a little bit of power and talking to the big bully. Like, hey, what are you going to do? We got guns too. So Cuba was doing that. And now Juan Bosch coming from Cuba. So that kind of scared the Americans. That scared the American, American industries. And they were worried about what's next in the Dominican Republic. And Felipe was one of the four high profile people in the US at this time. At this time, you knew the Alou, the, Alou, the Alou brothers. You had, right now you had every baseball game, you will hear the name Alou because Matt, Mateo, his little brother, and Jesus playing for another team and, and Felipe. And he was torn that, that every time he will have to travel back, uh, it will be hard because um, people are just worried about the spread of socialism. So it became very political. Um, and there was a lot of civil war. So it's, it was in a, a, a safe to be in the Dominican Republic during this time, all right? Because one, one thing that he, that he quoted is that nobody respected the junta. The junta, it was, it was just a joint government system while they elected the new president. 
And that's when things started getting ugly. This is why I put that image in the bottom where you had a lot of Americans walking around um, the US and that definitely had an effect on, on his, his view in terms of being a major league player. As well as you could just imagine um, everybody that was asking for him to step up or you know the pressures, but he wanted to make sure that he could continue being an example in the US, uh, be able to feed his family. So it was a very, very tough time for ball players as well as people like him. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Claudia. Have a good night. We're all, and we're almost done. I know I talk all day. And um, you know, I know you guys are getting tired of me, but bear with me. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions in terms of where Felipe was in his mind of, of um, <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. Um, where, where, if anybody has any things that they want to add in terms of do you lose, as well as this time, you could put in Cardi, uh, Ricardo Cardi, and all the other Latin American players at this time. One thing that I, this is outside of the book, is that also really challenged. Um, remember, Felipe was looked as the leader, all right? By now, during 1965, he was looked at as the leader of like the, the Dominican players, all right? And many people outside of baseball, being a, a representative almost, he almost was like an ambassador to the US because you didn't have a lot of famous people of Dominican descent. So anything he will say, anything he will do, any way he moves, um, the Americans are looking at him, the Dominicans are looking at every step and that must've been very challenging. All right, even though he had great years batting and great numbers while he was in Atlanta, all right? And also Fidel at this time, Fidel Castro, uh, before 1963, he was, you know, he, there was a different documentary that I saw in, in Netflix about the Pittsburgh Pirates. And at that time, Roberto Clemente was playing for the Pittsburgh Pirates and Mateo Alou was playing for the Pittsburgh. And before they traded Mateito, they went to the World Series and they asked Fidel Castro while he was in the UN, who, you, who are you going for for the World Series? And it was Pittsburgh against the Yankees. He's like, of course, I'm going with all the Latino players and the black players are playing to beat the Yankees. And that kind of played a big thing where people were like, we got to keep an eye on. They basically saying that we got to keep an eye on these Latin players are coming from abroad because they could be spies, they could be, so they had a lot of things being highlighted. It was a lot of things on their back, okay? All right. So once, once, the, once um, they got past the 60s, he had great numbers in the 60s, his, his career started diminishing as a, as a player, but Felipe, is, he doesn't stop. Felipe is a very ambitious, determined man. And, um, and he earned a lot of experience coaching in the Dominican League for the best team, of course, Escogido, you know what I mean? Um, but in Lice, um, in the Pollitos, in the, in the North. Um, he was able to start managing in, in, in the minor leagues, all right? At this time, there was no Dominican player that has ever attempted that. All right, so Felipe was a, a, a man that really, uh, against all odds, against racism, against um, things that people say, you can't ever do that. He was really going for it, all right? And um, he was a trailblazer, naturally, a leader. So he was able to, got, he got an opportunity to coach from the minor leagues and was able to work his way up. And when he worked his way up, he was given the opportunity to uh, um, he was able to, to, to coach the Expos, the Montreal Expos, which in 1994, before the lockout, they had the best record in the major league, all right? And they never seen that. And one thing that I, I liked about the Expos and people always manage is that he took the players that nobody wanted. And he took the players that he had a relationship with, mainly many Dominican players, 
All right. So he started passing the baton and highlighting players like Pedro Martinez. All right. So when we talk about Pedro Martinez, which the book is also is forward. So it's meant that it's, it's coming from the voice of Pedro Martinez. All right. You'll see it in the bottom that he loves like a son. All right. And um, Pedro, Pedro, uh, yeah, Pedro, he is, so the, the story of Pedro is that his older brother was the guy that everybody wanted. But be, and because Pedro was a little shorter, about 5'9", five 5'10", five nobody really wanted him. And he was just there in America, hold, and his brother played for the Dodgers, Ramon Martinez. And he would hold his big brother's bags and, and things of that nature. But Pedro, back home, he played for the Escogido, you know what I mean? best team. And he said, you know what, let me give this little guy an opportunity. And Pedro, as you guys know, flourished, flourished, and is now a Hall of Famer. Probably, you know, like, like Denny mentioned on the chat, that is his favorite player of all time. And you know what? It's probably everybody. I don't know. A lot of people's favorites. Yeah, I remember, I, I love, oh, she love baseball, but when I was younger, the three best pitchers in baseball in the early 90s were Nolan Ryan, <laughs> Roger Clemens, and Ramon Martinez. I remember that. Like, Ramon was lights out for the Dodgers. Before he got hurt, he was more lights out. You know? And nobody wanted him. But uh, Felipe said, I'm going to take you. But the other thing is that he did the same thing with Vladimir Guerrero, where everybody wanted, which is my ultimate favorite, Wilton Guerrero. And Wilton was the older brother, for, and Vladimir was, he's a very humble guy. They call him, am I supposed to say that? Well, um, somewhere in the family, they said that they call him the mute because he was always quiet. He didn't say a word. He would not laugh. He was just there. He was just a very humble guy to this day. And he also played for Escogido, and he said, when you come to America, I'm going to put you in the Expos and give him a shot in the big leagues. Boom. He is a Hall of Famer now. So when people thought that Felipe could not develop players or just look, some people just make it on their own and say, hey, I'm the best and forget about everybody. He literally took people and families and made them better. All right. And this is why you have so many different um, baseball academies in the, in the DR, which, you know, some of them have controversy. But he wanted to make now they put education programs in these baseball academies and now they have the Felipe Alou Academy in by Boca Chica uh, because he noticed and cultivated a lot of um, talent. Another talent that from Haina um, is David Ortiz. David Ortiz used to go by the name of David Arias. All right, nobody wanted him at one time until Felipe said. You know, he had, his brother was a scout for the Red Sox and said, hey, Hesualu was it? And, and they allow him to have an opportunity to play um, in the Red Sox and it changed his whole life and his outlook and his career. All right. So uh, Felipe really looked out for everybody. He paved the way, but also, um, uh, let me just say one thing. Um, he paved the way and, um, you know, he paving the way he made sure that he represented the Dominican players as well as um, people of color in, in the earlier part of the league. I know Kari, Karina, Karina had her hand up. Oh, I think oh, she was waving at me, I think. Okay. And I decided to just remember when Pedro was in the minors for the Dodgers forever, and he wasn't getting any chances or opportunity. So Felipe traded for him. Then mm -hmm. he forgot for like nothing too. He got him from the Dodgers for absolutely nothing. And all of a sudden gave him his chance, gave him opportunity. And then he was lights out. I think I'd love Pedro, but remember he pitched the perfect game past the ninth inning going into the 10th before he gave it up. So he went something like nine and two thirds, perfect game before he gave up a hit as well. And that's with the Expos. And that was his second year, I think, there too. Yeah, no, you, you got a good memory. Um, I think we're aging each other, um, Denny, because I, I, I definitely remember those those games. <laughs> They're awesome. Yeah. No, that it, people looked at, uh, oh, Felipe is crazy. He's, he's building a team uh, of nobodies and then ended up being one of the 
uh, better teams in the U.S. And, and as well in the in the in the league because that was a Canadian team. And then he ended up having his son Moises Alou, where where I, I don't even think the family expected him to go that high, which he became the best player in the family. And and now Mo Alou is you know uh, almost I feel that he should be in the Hall of Famer, but you know um, it didn't work out. But he. He had the best numbers and he was developed through Felipe. So um, Felipe, once he, he finished with the Expos, he was invited back and he went to San Francisco um, to, to coach the Giants, all right? And he was able to coach Barry Bonds when he broke the record and, you know, and, and, and all of that. Even though there's a lot of controversy with the juicing. Um, it's not green juice, it's, you know, steroids. Um, and, um, he coached there and, you know, and he, he led, he led, um, the San Francisco giants in terms of he never won the championship, but he wanted to make sure that he led with example. So his legacy is a person that really put it out there. Um, and also displayed of the, the how Dominicans were viewed in the United States early on. All right. He was like the Guinea pig. And he was able, um, I'm talking about that his time was in front, you know, front street in terms of being a big leaguer. Of course, we had Dominicans in different communities, but on TV, uh, you never seen that. And he had the whole country on his back and his, his legacy uh, is, is major because of his greatness. So um, I will say, if you guys have any things to add, of uh, regarding the book, anything you liked, um, um, I will segue it to you guys. If you guys want to say anything about the great Felipe Alo. Yes. Okay, you guys are shy today. All right. Well, <clears throat> Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is one of my favorite books. It was very easy to read. And it's not one of my favorite books just because we have family relation, but it's because it was enjoyable. One of the things that I didn't want to say too much is that he really, one of the funny things that he said when he's growing up in the Dominican Republic um, as a teenager, the water will come down. Like the people at that time didn't have an iPhone where you check the weather they would look in the sky and they'll say, hey, it's gonna rain at four o'clock to six o'clock. And I don't know if you guys read that part where he miscalculated and him and his friends would take off all their clothes. And while it's pouring, everybody would close their doors while it rains. And so basically he went outside naked and he noticed that it cleared up. Now he's in the street naked with his friends and now they had to run back and very humiliating. So just showing out how, how even when you don't have anything, you can definitely make the best out of you know, the situation and have fun and have good memories. So I will end it there. That was great, Remy. <laughs> uh, uh, hi. Hey, how you doing? Good, great. Thank you. This was awesome. I just have a, uh, a question just something that you had mentioned regarding 